Matt Scalarud from Pink Banana Media is our guest today, and we have a gift box from a listener in Fort Worth, Texas. This is The Focus Group. It's the savvy side of 9 to 5. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. <laughs> and learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is The Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S-T-A-U-N-C-H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. Welcome to The Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Mr. Tim Bennett. Find us every Wednesday on Facebook Live or YouTube from 1 to 2 p.m. Of course, focusgroupradio.com has all our media all the time you want it. And visit there anytime you like. You get the show's audio or video streams. And Focus Group Radio is the social media handle. Now, what are you doing with your... I was looking at something. <laughs> <laughs> I was having trouble seeing. I Yeah, just a little blip. There's something on the glass? Something on the glass is what it was. I thought it was on my shirt, but it's on the glass. So welcome to the show. It is our, uh, we're flying through the year. We're like almost you counting the days. It's amazing. Like, and, and hey, welcome to the first day of spring. Today's the official first day of spring, right? The, 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 is it? Yeah, the equinox is today. Then I got to get over to uh, Rita's Water Ice in Philly. They give a free water ice on the first day of spring. Really? That and Dairy Queen's now doing it. Uh, the water, the water ice is the flavored flavored ice, and it's it's odd because people there's a whole science to it. People, I know someone who's a multi multi millionaire that waits for this day, and loads her car up, her SUV with coolers, and goes around and gets her free water ice all over. Spends a whole day doing it. What does she? She puts them in a cooler. Then what does she do with them? Take them home and then they put them in her freezer and then she eats them for the next you know week or two. This is why she's a millionaire. I bet I know who you're talking about. Do I know? I'm not going to say it, but can I guess? You might. Yeah. <laughs> but can you imagine going from place to place to get your free water ice? No. No, it does. I, one is enough. And if it was a Dairy Queen thing, I'd be happy with a soft serve vanilla dipped in chocolate. I love Dairy Queen. Is there a Dairy Queen here in Manhattan? No, but we have a, uh, we have a what Bob used to love, hilariously call the brazier. Remember, he used to be yeah. the brazier, whatever the the, the brasserie. Uh, <laughs> we have a brazier up near us. Brazier, brazier. <laughs> it was B R A Z I E R, right? Yeah, brazier, brazier, yeah. And they did a they did a uh, the hamburger. Everybody said was quite good. good. But I, I no, it's the Dairy Queen soft serve vanilla with, dipped in chocolate. That was my thing. So I used to dip in butterscotch. Oh wow! I never did. You really? Yeah. I should know this. I'm not a to... chocolate guy. Yeah, you know, I come to think of it, and we were growing up, you were not, I never did take note of that, but I was always the chocolate guy. One thing I did get with chocolate, which I still do to this day now and then, is orange sherbet ice cream with chocolate. Now that, that is. People always would say it was gross, but after they tried it, it's pretty darn good. <laughs> so I, I chocolate said. Chocolate and orange. By the way, to hearken back to something many of our listeners know. We were having, uh, I think Bob and I were um, splitting the last piece of this carrot cake that we got upstate, and it's, it's the best carrot cake. Where'd you get carrot cake from? Hannaford's. It's the grocery store, but it's... Grocery first, store carrot cake, and it's good? It's delicious. It's moist. It's good. So I said, you know, Bob, if 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 you if it was down to you, me, and Tim that we're going to have this piece of carrot cake, all you have to do is put a piece of vanilla ice cream right next to that cake, and Tim will it. never touch it. <laughs> that would be it. The cake would... Yeah. Well, if you were smart. <laughs> I did that in college with pizza Strategic. because I used to order pizza all the time and kids would come in and if they saw your pizza, you know, they'd you'd wait for the pizza guy to deliver in the frat house and then everybody would hover around whoever paid for the pizza. Oh, what'd you get? And by time everybody would oh, take, take a slice, you'd have nothing left. So this kid, Dave Ryan, and I agreed that we were going to order the grossest pizza that he and I would be able to eat that no one else would take. So we always ordered a pizza with green peppers, onions, and black olives. Not so bad. But nobody like would touch it. That's not a bad... So we knew. We were like, people didn't want the black olives, particularly where the, the big turnoff. And so he and I would get it, and no one would come touch the pizza. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, All right. So you got to figure that out. We were uh, upstate where I went to school. It was Pudgy's, Pudgy's Pie. It was a square. Pudgy's? That was the name of the most... But then Domino's came in and yeah, kind of ruined everything. Hey, before we go too, too far into the show, I want to say that last weekend, and I talked to you about this, I had the pleasure of going to Carnegie Hall to see a concert put on by the Brussels Orchestra. And the unique part of this was that a good old friend of mine named Tom Fiorini 
is in the he plays with his wife Christina in the Brussels Philharmonic. Um, he this is his first time playing Carnegie Hall, and Tom the Brussels Sprouts. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's kind of a fun little take. So to see him on stage is amazing, and there's a picture of Tom with the conductor. Brussels Belgium. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly Brussels Belgium. Yeah. So who who's the is that his wife or who's that? I uh, know I think that might be his mother. I think that photo was taken in Florida. They were in Miami before they came to New York, and then on their far oh, right okay. is the conductor. And and Tom is uh, someone I've known for many years. He was my very first trainer when I began working out at the gym, and I trained with him for many years. And during that period of time, he made the announcement that he was going to go to he went to the Manus School of Music. He had already played bass guitar at that point, but he learned upright bass, which is a very beautiful instrument, finished his schooling in Maastricht over in Holland and has lived there ever since and married his beautiful wife, Christina. So it was really, really cool to be in the audience when someone's dream comes true, playing Carnegie Hall. And how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, just practice. practice. <laughs> so he plays the bass. Isn't that just three strings? Upright bass. How tough is that? I often wondered about that. Three strings, boom, boom, boom. Oh, no, no. I think it's, I think it's a hard instrument. It? Yeah, it's a very important section, the bass section. Didn't you play the tuba? Tuba, trumpet, and Which baritone. Which was also funny because essentially all you did was go boom, boom, boom. Uh, well, I Who actually, knows? while the while he was playing, I had a perfect view of him on stage. While I was playing, I was thinking, wow, he's in a ba bass section technically. I was in the brass bass section, but I was playing tuba. And yes, you, you always reference back to, because you used to see the school concerts with me talking to Denise in the yeah. back there all the time. Well, I remember there was one song, and I wish I could remember it, but it, essentially you... you chatted with everybody through the whole thing until like the very last note you went bah, bah, bah. <laughs> and that was your contribution to the big concert <laughs> with the tuba I thought I gotta play the tuba how tough is that Listen John's to back there having a good time chatting it up the other friend was boom 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 and then you're oh, oh. <laughs> that was the percussion guy sometimes yeah <laughs> and we all took a bow thank you <laughs> do you want to do our uh... yeah all right so we arrived in studio today, and we... I thought this was for my dogs. Because it came in a bark box. Yeah. You thought there was going to be treats. I thought it was for Spike and Trixie. But it was treats for us, and so right off the bat, where did I put it? Where did it come from? This came from our a fan in Fort Worth, Texas. We, are we ever going to find out who he or she I is? I believe I know who this is from, from email, and I have You're hiding to, it? I'm not hiding Beautiful it. Beautiful penmanship. But, oh, my God, the penmanship. Wishing you all the best this Easter, your Fort Worth fan. And look at the handwriting on that. I mean, this is like the kind of thing my mom would be like. Yeah. It's 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 perfectly legible. It's cursive. <laughs> so what do we have Everybody in our wants box? To find his name. So it's your Fort Worth fan. Man, you, you know, you could be a Fort Worth fan. Look, look, look. So what we have is we have Oreo thin, Bush. dipped. Uh, these are mint. Dip. I haven't tried those. Are those good? They're very good. This is white fudge dipped. So we have an array of things here. You want to see that? Okay. And then I have never seen this in my life. Oreo eggs. And it says cream filled with cookie pieces. These look, these look pretty cool. Have this, you opened those yet? Yeah? I, I opened them. But they're all individually wrapped. They're foil. And Tim, for you, you're getting a Matchbox car. Look, at you're getting a Subaru WRX WRX STI. Oh. And you'll notice that the notepad paper that says for Tim is a is Yoda. Thank you, our Fort Worth fan. Well, because so we know it's a we know it's a an, an, an turned recluse now. <laughs> Why? Because he likes Star Wars? You, um, I don't want a profile. <laughs> but look at how perfect for John is written. And I know, but you know, who who well and I got a Volkswagen, a 65 VW Type 3 Fastback. fastback. And it's, fastback it's like a, look at, this is like the classic Matchbox yeah. we had as kids. I used to love Matchbox. I still have my Matchbox vinyl carrying case, by the way. Um, <laughs> and it's filled with cars. And then, because you are doing well, because you are doing well, look at Ferrero Rocher. He must be doing well. He is doing, doing well. well. Ferrero Rocher eggs. I think this is fantastic. Now that was taken down on YouTube again. They keep taking down that little, little and stuff, and last but not least in our fantastic box is, have we sampled the, Garrett and guys, have we got carrot cake uh, we Oreos? We did. Did we rank this as good? Uh, it's an Oreo. Yeah. We did. One of the insiders at Oreo sent us this, the unmarked one. That's why you might not remember it. Remember they oh, came in the unmarked foil? This was before right. the... They said, don't tell anybody, but you're getting these a year before. So we tried those about nine months ago before they were a thing. 
So I, I, I remember seeing that. So they did pass pass the test. Yeah, I, I think they're. Uh, I they like are good. them. They, they are good. Um, I still think Garrett's kind of gotten the right camp on the birthday cake one with the vanilla cookie. Yeah. And with then, the vanilla cookie? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you try? Did you did you get any of these yet? Well, you've had these I already. I remember the carrot cake tastes like gingerbread, and I'm just not a fan of gingerbread. It does have a gingerbread yeah. taste to it. Yeah. Um, well, it's like ginger. Is it a gram? Is it a ginger gram cookie? It's or a gram. I think it's a gram cookie. Yeah. So thank you to our Fort Worth listener. We really appreciate this. I love my little car, and I love my little Yoda note, and I love all the stuff that it makes Tim <laughs> Tim crazy about. What Yoda? Yeah, you're like, oh, it's Yoda. I don't know, John. I think there's something a little odd about an older man with Star Wars. That's all. My mother sends me Star Wars things. I, I, you know, I've I've told my family repeatedly that I have enough Star Wars to last me five lifetimes. But, you know, it's consistent. I know know Garrett's with me. John, and our boys in the booth, John's a Star Wars fan, right? Oh, yeah. Garrett's like me. Yeah. Although I was very disappointed last week when I found (laughs) out he didn't bathe. And everybody, I mean, I thought Garrett and I were soulmates, and I find out he doesn't use soap. Well, he bathes. He just doesn't yeah. eat soap. He smells That's amazing. It. Everyone always does that. They think I don't take a shower or something. I do. I just... But you don't use any soap, and the listeners want me to smell you. I don't take $5 and throw it down the drain every day for no reason. And don't... No, 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 no. Don't you play, like, on his side on this, because... I just... You, I, I'm ivory soap. Look, I'm not... I, do, I use soap. You were going down, oh, yeah, no, you could just get but wet. But look, I appreciate the logic of not... Of not spending the money on some of these grooming products, which, you know, ancient man. I, well, you know, actually, ancient man did. A pretty have sensitive soap. nose. I will say he doesn't smell. <laughs> Thank you. I will say he doesn't smell. Thank but you. I'm going to be paying a little more attention as summer arrives. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John. Yeah. There you go. Hey, so um, before we move on, uh, this morning I had the pleasure of seeing Mayor Pete. Uh, are you on set? <laughs> <laughs> I had the pleasure. What do you think you are? <laughs> this morning I had the pleasure of seeing Mayor Pete. We all have a TV. We all have a TV. <laughs> Boy, some, are, you, are you having too much sugar? No, but I mean, that just was like I had the pleasure. As if you had coffee or something with him. <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, you are getting crankier and crotchetier. Like, in fact, someone said to me the other day, who, who's a big fan of the show, they're like, you know, is Tim shtick that he's a curmudgeon? I said, that's part of his shtick. He's a curmudgeon. Like, not shtick. <laughs> it's real. It's not an act. That's right. It's, so anyway, we love our stuff. Thank you, in Fort Worth. So I saw uh, Mayor Pete on um, Morning, Morning Joe. Joe, and it was, I was mesmerized because A, he answered every question they asked directly. He was thoughtful. He was smart. He didn't say anything negative or nasty. When he referred to the president, he just referred to him as the president. It wasn't like he was attacking him or anything. It was like, this administration's done this, or they believe that. I think it's pretty cool. Now, you were talking over lunch that he's an underdog, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's Pete Buttigieg, I think is how you exactly it's say right. it. And it it's, I mean, unfortunately, it's difficult to pronounce his name. But once or, you get you know, it. Spelling. But that's why everybody's calling him Mayor Pete. He's mayor of a uh, city out in Indiana. And they have said that he did a CNN town hall, and they said he's one of the only candidates that actually answers a direct question. question. Are you a capitalist? Yes. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't have to talk. You shouldn't have to think about that one. So, and he happens to be part of our community. He's LGBT. He's he's gay. He and his husband are married. Mm-hmm. And uh, and what you and I had said is what I find most interesting about the whole thing is that he's being taken seriously. And he's actually qualified to be on the debate stage. And I think he's going to outshine a lot of the other more traditional candidates. And uh, very smart, um, seems to know the issues. And we've said this before, I want my president to be smarter than me. Yes, yeah. And the one thing he did do, which I found fascinating and certainly considering all he does, is he was given a book by an author. And he read the book, he liked it, and then wanted to read more books by the author, but they were Norwegian. So he went and learned Norwegian. To read the book. read the books. Yeah. I wonder what the last book is that our current president's read, besides Penthouse. I'm thinking maybe it's Curious George Goes to the Hospital. That you know, the one, <laughs> the, the one where they find the puzzle piece that he swallowed, but I don't know. I'll be, I'll be curious to see if he, um, 
if he gets traction, I know we'll have uh, Matt Scalarud on later. I'll be curious to ask him what he thinks from a social aspect of whether there's some traction or they've seen some traction with, with... Hey, the other thing you and I talked about, quite frankly, is if he does get traction, let's just do a what if. What if he's one of the three or four candidates left moving through all the primaries? What's Trump going to start saying about him? All right, so he is part of the LGBTQ community. He does have a husband. Um, I think he has children. Yeah, and so... Goes to church and went to church before it was vogue to go to church. Has, he's he, so spiritual. Race, he went to a Catholic high school, but he's Episcopalian. Right. Um, he does believe that faith has a place. He does believe in the separation of church and state. I mean, he's very clear about a lot of things, but what... Fought Nick, in the Afghan war, you know? which is one of the few that has military experience that's running. But what is Trump going to... What's the president, as Pete would say, Mayor Pete, what's the president going to come up with on a nickname land, you know, because he always tries to find the one thing he could, like, nail someone. He already did it with Beto O'Rourke with the hands. Crazy. Is it crazy? <laughs> <laughs> no. But then everyone else was doing the hand yeah, thing, too. Yeah. I think a bunch of the, the pundits, the uh, talk show pundits. I like Beto O'Rourke. I think he reminds me a bit of kind of a Kennedy-esque candidate or, yeah, or, Robert or Kennedy, Obama's yeah. promise. And, you know, that's the tough thing with all of these. And I think there's so many people running. Maybe you and I should announce. What do we need to do? <laughs> Maybe we need to announce, yeah. But you can't teach charisma. No. And you can't teach presence. And for all the – everybody wants to criticize uh, Beto for not being maybe specific on some issues. He certainly has excited the electorate in yep. some regards. So we'll see what happens. I'm not excited by a lot of the candidates. Neither am I. Neither am I, I often wondered, does somebody tell you why waste your time? I mean, this Hickenlooper or whatever from Colorado. Oh, the Hing Hickenlooper, yeah. The, um, you well, know, he, he struggled just answering some basic questions. It's like, you're in for the big league here. Why? He, even, even like someone like Amy Klobuchar, yeah. who's been a part of the machinery in D.C. for a while. That's probably why I like Mayor Pete, because it's not that he's an outsider, but he hasn't been completely tainted by the double speak they all do on Capitol Hill. And I just feel like I'm get, like he immediately answers like, you know, there was a break. They took a break and they came back. And I think Mike Barnacle says, I want to talk about Christ. You know, that's that and many other politicians. That's like a grenade getting thrown right. at you. And he said, oh, let's talk about it. Because they all stumble with it. Right? He said, because here's a here. If we believe if we follow everything that's been written, here's a man who washed people's feet. Who, who took care of sex workers. Remember, remember, the answer was like, wow, you know, and it wasn't some version of Christianity or Catholicism that that people like to cherry pick. It's practiced, yeah. right. So uh, pretty cool. Well, you're a senator, uh, Gillibrand. Yeah, she's running. And they say your mayor may run. Oh, be, uh, by the way, internally in New York City, a number of people in the administration are like, are you crazy? Why are you going to do this? And by the way, this gets mid. You like De Blasio? I don't know what's going on. No, here. I didn't like I'm him. The I didn't like him from the beginning. I don't know if he's doing a good job or not. A lot of New Yorkers are very disappointed who voted for him. So who's going to run for mayor? Who? One of your friends. You semi-announced. One of my friends. Yeah, advertising agency guy. Oh, you mean uh, Donny Deutsch? Donny Deutsch says he's going to run. You know, Donny would be. I don't know. I'd give. I'd, I'd listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he built a company. Uh, yeah, I, no, you know. I think I think it'd be interesting. All right. We're in the age of celebrity politicians. Celebrity politicians. On that note, what caught your eye? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. So this came from the Washington Blade. And uh, the headline is, Gay Man Leaves D.C. Stonewall Exhibit Told He's Gonna Burn in Hell by His Lyft Driver. <laughs> I saw this. I, I saw your pictures in there before the show. So there are actually two people that this happened to. Now, I put that emoji in there if you're watching on the video. So apparently there's been some controversy about that emoji. It looks like prayers. It's praying hands. But that's not what it is. It's a high five. And everybody's been using it wrong for a long time, apparently. That's a high five? I think so. There's lots of controversy. I've been reading about it. There's, It's like supposed to be a high five of people been using it as praying hands and they used to have a little light coming out of it and then they changed it or whatever anyway so i guess it could be what you that's want. a whole show by itself i anyway. know so anyway that's why i put that there <laughs> but uh, so this is apparently the second time this has happened with a lift driver so I, I, i'll have to because a lot of it's alleged but uh, greg alexander attended a private dinner opening at rise up it is it's an exhibit he attended in early march as a guest of the washington blade and uh, he called for the Lyft driver, and they picked him up at the museum, which yeah. is the place where they were having the celebration. That's where celebration. they shoot um, ABC's Sunday show. 
They do? I didn't yeah. know that. He began talking to the driver who asked him what exhibit he had seen. He said he was at the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots, which helped launch the gay rights movement. The driver, who identified himself as Jeremy, said, gay rights, what's that? Is this a new movement? There's no need for gay rights, is what mm. the, the driver said. So as they approached Alexander's apartment, the, uh, the driver said, Greg, uh, do you believe uh, that God loves you? And then the driver started chanting biblical verses, and uh, Greg Alexander said, "Get, let me out of the car. Like, unlock the car, let me out. And he said, no, I want you to pray with me. He said, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Um, Greg said he started feeling very unsafe and said, please let me out, and asked the driver to unlock the door. And the driver again said, no, not until you pray with me. They finally got out, the gay... Um, uh, gay person, Greg said, what do you think is going to happen to me? He says, you're going to burn in hell. God loves everyone, but he hates your sin. So he immediately called Lyft, who um, followed up on what had happened, and they essentially terminated the driver. They said that they don't tolerate uh, discrimination in the community and this sort of behavior from their driver. Safety is their top priority, and they had no place for this harassment or discrimination of any kind. And they permanently banned uh, this guy, Jeremy, from driving again. Apparently, the same thing happened to another driver uh, or another from another Lyft driver by another resident named Matt Johnson, who was in the car. He got picked up at DuPont Circle, and on his way home, he had mentioned something about his husband. The driver pulled over and said, get out. You know, I don't want you talking. I don't want gay people in the cab, essentially, mm. or in the Lyft car. We've and, heard a uh, number of these things. Told him up, to right? get out. So... And the same same thing happened again. They did not relieve this driver of his of his duties at Lyft, but um, they went through the same thing about we don't believe in discrimination and credit him back his his fee. But I'd wondered. It made me think. Have you ever? You know, you live in Manhattan, which is the land of cabs and taxis or whatever. Have you? Ever, I know you take the subway a lot, but have you ever experienced any discrimination in a taxi or? Nope, quite the Uber, opposite. Uber I have had some or, of the most hilarious conversations of living in New York City talking to cab drivers. And there was one time I was coming back from JFK, and the door closed as we pull out, and the uh, guy, I gave him the address again. And we're driving along, and uh, he's like, why, he goes, why do you live in New York? I said, well, you live here. He goes, well, I know why I live here. I'm asking you why you live here. And he was smiling. There was nothing, and I said, oh, it's cultural. He goes, no, 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 no. You live here because it's a money town. People come here to make money. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, my son, like he went through his family and, and how he raised his kids, but he's here because it's a money town. The, the, and he, this is back before Uber and Lyft. Right. So you, you could still make a good so living. What would you have done? If, so it's two in the morning. He gets picked up it's, aside from the first one that said he was going to burn in hell. But the other one, if you and Bob were in there and mentioned that that was your husband and the guy pulls over, you're 50 blocks from home and he says, get out. What would you do? I guess well, you get out. I'd probably get out because, A, I'm not wanted in that cab. But then there's this part of me that's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the whole denial of service issue of you're supposed to be colorblind to your, your customer, the whole bit. Um, but I'd stew and I'd be furious about it. And it would probably, you know, eat a little hole in me, <laughs> if that makes sense. I mean, yeah, no, I, well, I wonder. I also picked don't... The, he picked the guy up in DuPont Circle after the bars closed at 2, 2 a.m., 2.05. So... Who do you think's out at 205 in the gay area if you're the, if you're a driver, right? So yeah. why take the fare or why take the job? Now, but I don't know what I would do if somebody acted like that. I guess I, you'd get out too because you'd fear for your safety of, okay, this guy's a lunatic. Would you have bothered if you were provoked when someone says about gay rights? Well, what do you mean gay rights? Like, would you have just like not said a word or would you have responded if you were provoked in that direction? I was in a... Uber in South Carolina, and the guy went off on trans rights, the bathroom issues, and kept, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And I, we didn't say a word. Just kept quiet. And, and I that's my, I think that Don't that have a be, thought about it. Yeah. Because you're not, obviously, it's- You're not going to change your mind. You know, nope. And it wasn't worth it, and we needed to get where we were going. Mm -hmm. It was raining, and I didn't want to get kicked out, and I, but I, I- you know, part of me says, should I have argued with him? Or, or, But there was no way you were going to school this person on. When someone approaches you with that mentality, it's a one-way conversation. And that's what I would say about all of this is, and to answer your other question, if somebody has an issue with me and Bob being married or something and they don't want me in the car or whatever, I'm not going to. 
I could argue about you, you, have, you can't do this, you have to provide the service. You, you could do all of that until you're blue in the face, but you're not going to change their behavior or their, or their, their point of view. Yeah. So what caught your eye? Mine was a very simple, lighthearted thing. I love public art, and I love it when it's done with, with humor. And two days from now, in Hong Kong's harbor, uh, the artist, street, design, street artist and designer Brian Donnelly, who's 45, he's commonly known as Cause, K-A-W-S is his kind of nickname. He has a character he created many years ago called Companion, and Companion kind of looks like a doll with X's for eyes. Like It's like a teddy bearish, uh, well, actually I say it's a cross between like a Mickey Mouse and something else. Well, he's going to float an enormous version of this character in the Hong Kong Harbor for, I think it's 10 days. And there's precedent for this. There's a, uh, we're showing- Who pays for this? It's a foundation, it's an art foundation. Um, that's a test float, by the way. So if, if you happen to be watching the video, um, you'll see an image of this thing called Companion. That's his character. He, every art piece he does is of this character. That's companion. art? That's Companion, that's art. Um, I'll, so it's a it's like a, a big inflatable doll, I guess. And two many years ago, or in 2013, was it 2013? Um, a Dutch artist floated a yellow rubber duck, an enormous yeah, version of, Philly. of a yellow duck in the Hong Kong Harbor as well. And um, I just thought it was kind of a fun thing. It caught my eye because it's 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 public art, right? It's uh, it's so let's go to the next. Uh, yeah, so there's the duck. <laughs> and well, there's Tim, that thing sitting. That's the third. That's companion, and I really? put I put a picture in this in in what we're looking at of this artist piece, this companion character sitting in the train station of Philadelphia. It's the lower right corner. And Tim, you never saw it. Well, you used to take the train a lot. You didn't. I'm out of Trenton now sometimes because it's easier. But if this is art, I could do art. <laughs> I can go buy a pool toy and blow it up and stick it on a pedestal. Yeah, that is so far from a pool toy. Please. They had, John, do you think that's art? Yes, I do. I think it's very it's not there forever. It's it's an ex, it's an installation for a while. I the think it's a rubber fun. duck. The duck is hysterical. The duck is like a thousand times the size of a rubber duck you'd have in like your bathtub. That's why I think it's fun about I'm it. I'm going to do one next summer. Big bar of soap. <laughs> I'm going to put a rope on. I'm going to call it Garrett. I'm going to float it around Manhattan. <laughs> and then we could have focus group cruises on the circle line to see Tim's, uh, Tim's artwork, right? You've you're, 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 you're get, you got to get out of New York. You're getting too soft. I just love looking at that stuff. Anyway, I thought that was the whole thing. You, you, <laughs> had, you had this, like, traumatizing get-out-of-my-lift car, and I'm trying to elevate it with cool a blow-up duck. And a, yeah, all right. <laughs> Moving on. I'd like to have one, though. Can you buy a little one? You could buy a little companion. You could buy a little, yeah, you could buy things. Well, I'm going to get you that for your birthday. That's, that's, the inter that's the intersection of art and commerce because I, I, when I found some of these pictures, I also found the website you can buy all the little miniatures on. I was I like, what it oh. costs. Did you check? They're, they're expensive. These, these figures that he does are one-offs. They're made by like Funko or I think there's these like companies that do it. And some of them are like a hundred and some bucks a piece for something this big. I'm like, eh. I made a little too much. Business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings. But the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. Douglas Rainsford Tompkins was born March 20th, 1943. He died in 2015 kayaking at 72 in Chile. He's a, a conservationist, outdoorsman, philanthropist, filmmaker, agriculturalist, and businessman, John. He, uh, and he didn't do toys that float around Hong he didn't Kong? Do, well, he could have. <laughs> he was the founder of uh, North Face. The North Face. Wow, really? Okay. And also the Esprit Clothing Company. So uh, in 1964, Douglas and his wife Susie started North Face as a mail-order retail company selling rock climbing and camping equipment. And what they were most known for is their tents. And you can see there's a picture of there if you're watching on the video in the upper right. They were the first one to make tents without poles in the middle. So they were very popular because you had... Easy to put up. Easy to put up, and it had the bent... We all remember those kind of dome-looking tents. Uh -huh. They said they held up better in more severe weather because the wind blew over them uh, a lot easier because they're more aerodynamic, but it, you were also able to use more space because you didn't have that pole in the middle, which seems very Obvious now, now right? right? But, yeah. You'll love this, John. Two years later, he sold his rights and sold North Face for $50,000. What? <laughs> to a friend of his. 50000 That yeah. company's worth... Yeah. Sold wow. It. Well, John in the booth is like, yeah, that was a... Yeah. Well, he decided yeah. he wanted to focus a little more on adventure filmmaking, but 
he and his wife and their friend Jane began designing girls' dresses on their kitchen table and sold them out of the back of their VW bus. So in 1971, they started a company called Esprit. It was originally called Plain Jane. You remember those Esprit clothes? I do. I do. And uh, that actually got a lot bigger than North Face. It, uh, it grew from a catalog company to actually having uh, a number of retail locations around the world. And uh, they operated in over 60 countries and uh, were very popular, particularly in, in Asia, but uh, also in Europe. He sold that company as well back to his ex-wife. And then he took all his money and bought all of this land in Argentina and Chile, became the largest private landowner in the world. And then took care of this land and then gave it to the countries of Argentina and Chile to help preserve land. So it's a conservancy yeah. now? Okay. Yeah. And uh, while he was in Chile in uh, 2015, at uh, very healthy, but um, he was kayaking and his kayak flipped over. He ended up uh, going brain dead and died shortly later. Oh, my God. Wait, I re- you said 2015? Yeah. I do remember reading about that. Yeah, that was, yeah, you're right. That was a free, terrible accident, and he wasn't, what, 70, you said 72? 72. Yeah. The first North Face store opened in 1966, and they had a band playing there at the opening, of the grand opening of the store. Any guess what band would be opening for North Face? 1967. Well, it could have been the band Whiteface. <laughs> the Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead was Isn't that playing. great. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday, Douglas. All right. Good birthday. Hey, uh, many of you know that Deep Discount is a partner of ours here on the Focus Group, and uh, there's a there's a way to get there. You go to focusgroupradio.com, click on the F- Deep Discount logo, which is a shark, Arr! and it's named Sharky the Shark. And we'd love you to get there that method by going to our site and then clicking on it, on the shark logo, because we get credit for that. And uh, it's site-wide Shark Madness sale this month. Everything's on sale. And, in fact, the, the copy here reads, save on tens of thousands of items, which is another fancy way of saying everything on the site. <laughs> everything. Thousands so and hundreds in, of thousands of items. In spirit of that, and we could, we actually, we're allowed to do anything we want. I think we both picked movies. We could have picked toys or, you know. I, I had picked, a, well, yeah. Sometimes you pick records yeah. and music. So what'd you pick as your thing this so week? So this week I picked, um, I love this show. After, I was a huge fan of, fan of Seinfeld. And I, I really haven't watched any sitcoms from, from, uh, from network TV since. But HBO, from the same creator, Larry David, did Curb Your Enthusiasm. Did you ever watch it? Yes, yeah. So I think I, it's an acquired taste. I loved it. Everybody said I would like it. I was late coming to it, but um, yeah, you're I was clicking around. <laughs> you are so curb your enthusiasm. I and tell you, I was, and I I love curb your enthusiasm. So I it was on HBO, and I looked through, and you know, every I think there are ten seasons, and every show you know has a there's a certain point where it's just boom they nailed it like I Love Lucy I think it's the third and fourth season season yeah. are perfect and Curb Your Enthusiasm I looked through all the different episodes and for me the sixth season was the best and that was when they brought the family in from remember Hurricane Katrina well they called it Hurricane Edna and they brought in this family from from the hurricane called the Blacks which were black and uh, to move into Larry David's house out in uh, out in California in L.A. area. And the episodes were just some of my favorite ones. So it was Meet the Blacks, which was fantastic. The Ida Funkhauser Roadside Memorial. Did you ever see that? It's something you and I did or would have done, I think. There's uh, this poor woman has, has died and he needs flowers for something and takes, money, takes the flowers off her grave and then f- gets caught. <laughs> and then my all-time favorite Kirby Enthusiasm episode is, is episode number six, season six, called The Rat Dog. The rat dog. So if, if, if you haven't watched any of them, could you literally pick up six seasons? Yeah, you six? could pick it up and, and you'd catch on pretty quick. It, it, the, the rat dog is, is um, <laughs> there's an issue with somebody who's deaf. He gets confused with sign language. He ends up inviting his um, exterminator to this play. <laughs> and did you see it? No, but it sounds funny. You just have to watch it because you can't, I don't want to ruin it for All you. Right. I never laughed so hard in my life. So... Get Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's nine ninety nine for the DVD. Ten episodes. You can't beat it. Complete season six. I mean, I went in a completely different direction. Um, I guess it's because of the amount of historical dramas that we've been watching lately. I think we watched Mary Queen of Scots the other day. And it reminded me that Helen Mirren 
has played royalty a lot. <laughs> and in fact, she played Queen Elizabeth, the current Queen Elizabeth, in the movie The Queen. But she also played Elizabeth I, the very first Elizabeth, uh, a daughter of Henry VIII, on an HBO show called Elizabeth I. And it's available at Deep Discount for fifteen eighty one. I believe it's a three-disc or two-disc set. Uh, it's three hours and 31 minutes, so it's probably three discs. And she plays the first Elizabeth, and it received great, great reviews because of its portrayal of the queen, how smart she was, how political she was, and it was very historically accurate. So I highly recommend it. It, was, it came out um, probably in 2004, 2005. And uh, it's well worth a watch. But you watch Helen Mirren, and you're like, wait a minute, she's in, she's the Queen Elizabeth of the modern time, and she's yeah. playing Queen Elizabeth I. And the release this week is Spider Man Into the Spider Verse on Blu ray. Now, you, did you see oh, this? Oh, I thought you were loved gonna, it. it. Yeah, I, I was going to make this my pick, frankly. Really? Because I went to see this on a Friday afternoon, long after the movie came out. It was in the theaters maybe one or two more weeks. I had to catch it on screen. I was completely blown away by the artistry, the storytelling, everything about it. It is a really fun movie. And all you have to know about Spider-Man, if you don't know much about the canon, is Peter Parker gets bit by a spider that gives him special powers. He has an uncle or a, a mentor figure that suddenly passes away and reminds him that with great power comes great responsibility. That's all you have to know. Everything else is so it gets the John stamp of approval. Oh, my God. It's animated, by the way, and it's animated in multiple styles. It's CG. It's 2D. It has a very... It, they bring the comic book to life in a way that is just phenomenal. I, it's, I think it's well worth the, 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 the purchase. Well, head over to focusgroupradio.com. It's a site-wide Shark Madness sale. Click on the Deep Discount logo. Start shopping away. I recommend Kirby Enthusiasm, the complete sixth season. John recommends Elizabeth One or Elizabeth the First on DVD. And the new release is Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Garrett. Thanks, Deep Discount. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have a friend of the focus group joining us, Matt Scalarud from Pink Banana Media and I Love Gay. We're going to catch up with Matt in just a few minutes. Stay with us. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with The Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. Hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. And joining us right now on set in the flesh and live is our friend Matt Scalarud from Pink Banana Media and I Love Gay. Matt, welcome to the show. Good Thank to you. see you. Love being here. All right. We were going to kick it off with sort of a highbrow thought process, but we'll go in any direction you'd like. And that is the following. One of your um, Pink Banana Media can talk to most any corporation client, big or small, and you can help them have a voice in social media. Am I? That's one aspect of what you do. And um, when we look at social media now, it seems like Facebook in particular, and I guess Instagram as well, um, and then of course Twitter, there's a lot of negativity or negative stories floating around about all those platforms, about transparency, user data, data being used improperly, influencing, they can't take things down fast enough that are fake, how do they flag real or fake? What do you, what's your take on all this? Well, social has grown up and now it's part of the real world. It's, oh, uh, good point. You know, so we loved it that, uh, we loved the beginning, you know, my mother would get on and, and watch her great grandchildren grow up on Facebook. That's the motivation is that they want to see these things. That was the beautiful part of it. That's when we're skipping through the poppy fields and we're all happy. And, uh, the downside is, is that there's people that don't necessarily think that same way, that uh, have ulterior motives, and they get in there, and we're like, I didn't even think about that. And yeah. that's what we're, you know, essentially, though, I mean, even today, even today, um, because Facebook, we do so much, everything's targeting. Everything we do for as a business is, is you, yeah, you can reach an LGBT audience, but we want to reach a more specific one. But Facebook today said, yeah, but now they've they lost the court battle. And they're colliding with uh, the rules, especially for real estate. So you can't really promote real estate or you, certain things you can't promote as categories that target by gender, by target by sexual orientation because it runs afoul of the laws. And I think the zip code is real estate one of them too. Would. Yeah. Real estate and a few other categories that they've just clamped down as of today. They said, nope, you can't do it anymore. Today. 
Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't see that. Yeah, I, I did see a story where they had said, um, I believe it was yesterday, mm-hmm. that they've looked at um, the 2020 election already, and they said that the Trump campaign has already invested millions, and they've already spent millions on Facebook. Yeah. And I was wondering what they were spending it on, or if they're just going right back to lock her up. <laughs> well, right. Well, putting out putting out pro Trump yeah. story, or putting out a a bad story about Bernie or about yeah, yeah. Uh, Biden or whoever. And we had talked about how if you were a newspaper in the old days and you did something like that, you had to say where it came from, right? You had to say that this was either, right, this was paid a paid, uh, yeah. paid advertisement. Do you have to do that with social you, media now? You do on Facebook now. So if it's political and and the problem is, is that they, they, they it always goes from one direction way over to another. So now many ads that aren't even political, they'll they'll tag them and say or flag it and say it's uh it's political and you need to be certified that yes we know who you are and you could definitely run that political ad on our platform and they uh and they'll even state in there this is paid for by and so they're they're getting into that now as well. So uh, this whole election is going to be very interesting because it is going to be very dominated by social and uh, you know that's the thing. Facebook is one area where we're going to continue to see. You know some some of your listeners may not like hearing this, but They've done a few studies, and they're realizing it's just this whole fake news and stuff on Facebook that people are seeing. is it, it, Sometimes it skews a little older when it comes to the, you know, people falling for it and saying, oh, that's got to be true. And they share it with all their family right. members. And younger people are a little more adept at just knowing how to weed through that stuff because they know it's, that, you know, just because it's just because it's online doesn't make it true. And so there's this, there's a lot of disconnects as far as. I don't know. That's a fascinating um, market observation, actually, that the uh, younger um, user of social media, maybe having been raised on it or having, yeah. they don't take it as, eh. It's not gospel. It's a, you know, you see something and you want to believe it's true maybe. And, and that's the whole thing. A lot of this feeds into what people want to believe. And, uh, but you see it. And, uh, I know for myself, I, if, if it looks, if it's not something I've heard before, it sounds rather interesting, different, compelling. I'm just going to wait till somebody else reports on it. Let's see if there's more articles about it. And sometimes there's just not, well, sometimes the source also tells you. So, the LGBTQ community has always been, I would say, at the forefront of technology. Yeah. Way, go way back to AOL chat rooms. And, and so we've always found way, safe spaces, I would say, to congregate or have conversations. Are all these new things that are going on with, with all the, the heavy hand of regulation, in many cases, necessary? Because, as you said, it's, they've finally grown up and welcome to the real world. How is that going to affect the uh, LGBTQ community, you think? Yeah, it's just we're we're just going to be right alongside. I mean, especially when we think of the concept of safe spaces and, you know, horrible videos that people can see on on Facebook. Always remember, you know, like the the shooting in uh in New Zealand. You know, we're not following those people those people on Facebook, so we're not seeing those those videos. So, it's still safe for us. We're mostly saying seeing things that are from uh, Facebook is so siloed that we really only see things that are that are specific specifically within our. They network. said they took down one and a half million videos. Yeah, because uh, you know they've got because because this is all you know the, they post it, they probably posted it. I'm sure they streamed it from uh, like a, a business page rather than a uh, personal profile. And yeah, all those crazies that share, saw share, it. Share, share, share. Yeah, and they see it, then they download it, and then they're able to share it. But it's still at least it's within their networks. Uh, we don't see it because we don't. We're not part of that, right? And so it's uh, but in general, it's uh, there's there's a lot of facets of how um, every time there's something comes along, it impacts. So what's happening with Facebook? They had said that they were going to change the platform toward more of a private chat sort of thing. So is that almost like text messaging? Nobody really knows because okay. uh, because the newsfeed is their bread and butter. Right. That's where they make really most of their revenue, and so because they're because they know a lot about us, which goes towards now. They're going to programmatic buying, programmatic and, and targeting, and and uh, but now the laws are going to make it so there's less opportunities there for advertisers to buy into. But what they're buying into is just to be part of that feed. If they're not part of the feed, because the feed is what people are looking at, and so if you're not there, and if you're an ad somewhere else, then you're invisible. And so, you know, that being their bread and butter, they're going to have to figure out how to make that work. And it's not necessarily the whole the private side is like st- Facebook stories, Instagram stories. They last for 24 hours. They're there. They're within a network. And people are successfully doing more advertising there, but the bread and butter and the majority of it is still not in that space. It's not in that ethereal. It comes and it goes. But as this as this roadmap changes, you have, you have to adapt pretty quickly yeah. on your business side because of what you're offering your clients. 
and you have to be a step ahead of it. So are you are you changing this the way you um, approach this with clients, or is, are you not at that point yet? Is it uh, just that Facebook is uh, for us? It's been secondary for a little while. So Instagram, I think, uh, is your well, no, not Twitter. And so Twitter. Um, Instagram is where most people seem say that they spend their time. But it's hard to monetize. It's hard to. It's it's great if, but you can run an app, a beautiful ad on Facebook, and that's what it goes to. Yeah. Facebook, you're either within your nice little silo. This is my five thousand maximum friends, family, and people, or you put it on a business page, and you're paying. To, if you put it on a business page, no one really sees it. They just don't really show that very much unless you pay. But when you pay, you can actually make that also show up on Instagram as well. So now you're kind of leveraging, but through a paid advertisement, very in, very inexpensive. But you're really leveraging Facebook and Instagram for that. But the but the wide open field for all this stuff, especially organic, is still Twitter. Um, not everybody's into it, but for those that are, I think they quoted 126 million daily active users, which is very important because that's the key number of how many people are actually using it actively every day. Instagram was, I think, about 180 million, and then Facebook is far higher, but it's siloed within our networks. So the Facebook number has to be taken with a not a grain of salt, but you have to parse that because the numbers are representative of the different islands or silos yeah. that you happen to be in. Yeah. So a client comes to you, let's say it's a destination because mm -hmm. you do a lot of work with uh, multiple yeah. tourism uh, agencies. What does a Twitter... Um, what does a Twitter outreach look like, let's say, for... Let's just pick uh, Manchester, England. Yeah, yeah. Well, what they're going to do is... Uh, is uh, Typically, they have a story to get out. So, yeah... It's, Getting that story out, uh, pushing it through Twitter, um, as well as Facebook, and and um, do you help them with so the story? Forth. Yeah, we'll help them. Uh, I mean, they, if they we'll have a vague idea, but do you then say this is what you have to do to create a story, a, comp a compelling? We usually listen to them and try to figure out like what story do you want to tell, and then we find sometimes we'll have a writer kind of help put uh, put that together, or there'll be uh, media that that have already written stories, and we can work with that. But um, also, especially when you're dealing with social and stuff. Uh, uh, there's a lot of influencers out there, especially in the travel world, and we'll sometimes leverage them to be able to help create content. Uh, sometimes what they're able to do is create content kind of in advance of, like, say, an event and talk about it and then integrate their social media posts into that kind of content mm -hmm. and that story. And then during the event, let's just say it's a Pride Festival or something, then there's lots of content. You know, you've got this bell curve, and it's like tons of stuff coming up then. So you want to really focus on what can we do in advance, what can we do focusing on during, and then afterwards... What happens? Does that stuff just go away? And so, but a lot of times we'll work with influencers or media that can create something that integrates the social media and a good story, and that'll last for a year or two. Google will pick it up. You can uh, take that content and then target it to in Facebook, outside of just Twitter, and uh, and really just kind of keep that story alive for quite a long time. But that's essentially what we do. We work with destinations or any company, and try to get away from just the idea of I want to buy an ad. And let's say let's figure out like usually they have story. a story to tell, yeah. and it's such a wide variety of different ways to do that, including the ad. We're talking to social media expert Matt Scalarud, his company Pink Banana Media, or I, hashtag I Love Gay, yeah. which which we've been tagging our stuff with. You've been doing a lot of travel, I think, this quarter. Where, where any any great places you've been recently? Yeah. Well, I just got back from Berlin. There was a big uh, uh, travel conference out there, a convention, ITB, it's called, and that was incredible. I mean, I never even saw the whole thing. Can you imagine going to a convention and it's just so large that you know, you'll never yeah, see? Yeah, large in terms of. Physical size is really? just, it's, it's really that big with every country represented with these huge spaces. And uh, there was a nice LGBT travel pavilion, and so we were a part of that and did all of our schmoozing and networking. It was good. Any surprise countries there uh, that you wouldn't expect? Well, oddly enough, they put the LGBT travel pavilion right next to uh, Tunisia and Algeria. And Iran was uh, had a, not as so much as a country, but Iran... Uh, Iran had a crang and a new... A just down news. the row, and everybody got along just fine, but we did think it was a little odd. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a mapped issue. <laughs> Someone's in an office like, where are we going to put the pavilion? Right over here, right? But they didn't even think about it. It's probably. like when I worked for, for Subaru, they put they put Israel at the table with Iran, Iraq, Syria, Jordan at this international conference we were at. And we're like, oh my god, what did you the, the Middle East? <laughs> <laughs> and they did the same thing with the Koreans, the Japanese, and and Chinese. They all don't get along. Yeah, Asia. I was like, okay. I think we were just in the back 40. They just said, oh, we'll put them back there. But it worked very well. What's going on in the travel space? Yeah. Well, that's, you know, well, number one, uh, uh, they'll love it when I say it. IGLTA is coming here next month, and that's the biggest uh, uh, international gay and lesbian travel association, and their whole convention is here. So for travel, it's real big on New York right now. So. Right. 
Um, is it because of Stonewall in. 50 and New York or yeah, World Pride? Part of it, because then once you go from IGLTA's event in April, and then you go over, you know, two months later is World Pride and everything going, and that's just going to be a crazy few months here in New York. And so a lot of people are traveling in for a wide variety of reasons. Is there a way a brand could take advantage of that from a social aspect? Oh, yeah. Because, you know, number one, all you have to do is talk about what you're doing uh, and, and hashtag, hashtag Stonewall50, hashtag World Pride 2019. That gets you in there. But you have to do it in a real way. You don't just want to, because you see this all the time. Somebody just posts something and hashtag has no relevance. And people kind of look at whatever they see it. But if there's something relevant that, that's, that's part of the story, a brand, and there's quite a few that I think are getting preparing themselves to be a big part of that here. What are the uh, what are the expectations? What, how do you tell a client? Here's what your expectations should be yeah, yeah. coming out of a camp of a storytelling campaign. Let's say it's the Twitter example of Manchester. You use yeah. I have a story to tell because you could probably, through very detailed research and a whole bunch of mechanisms, track the story, the successful storytelling to a ticket purchase or a des or, or getting to the destination, but that. That's a real complex path. What's the best a client can hope for? Well, that's uh, they still want. Uh, we were meeting with Las Vegas recently, and as far as tourism, and if you just say it's the click through, they're going to throw you out of the office. So uh, they want a room. They yeah, want you. Yeah, a room. They want to yeah. make sure you're talking uh, business, and and they use the word KPI a lot. But it's just you know what are you able to measure that that shows that this is performing. But that's the beauty of it too. Before, if it was just uh, banner advertising, you're just buying. By the th every thousand impressions, so you're just buying thousands and thousands of impressions, hoping for a click through, and then from there they, you know, you could track them, but there's not a whole lot left. But when it, in today's world, there's another piece with engagement, where not only did they see it, they click on it, but did they share it? Did they like it? Did they do something more with it? And you're seeing that, um, especially when those conversations, when it's not just content, but a lot of these conversations, and that's what social media is, just people talking. And those conversations, you can kind of predict more what, how you're going to do because, you know, working on, like on Twitter, if we post something, we'll always have like a minimum of a thousand impressions. No matter what, we post it, it'll always get about a thousand. But if we do our job right, it'll get five to ten thousand. But at least that way we kind of have a range and we know no matter what we do, if you do it the right way strategy-wise, hashtags and connecting it up with the right profiles, um, you're going to do pretty decently well. And you spread that out the, on the average. Um, Companies now have a better idea how well they're going to do without just buying a bulk of impressions. Vegas seems to have, uh, they were very, very deep, it, it, at least it yeah, felt yeah. like from our perspective of reaching the LGBT traveler. But then it seemed to have gone off. Is that they, true? They all, they, most of them, I was going to say they all do, but I might get in trouble. But no, I think they, most I, of them do. They, they uh, didn't get out. They get it, and, uh, and they don't see them. The business thing aspect, not just speaking for Vegas or anything, but a lot of them just get in, do it, and then realize, like, okay, this is what we wanted, and then uh, and then they feel like they don't have to work as hard anymore. Um, That's a good way of saying it. They, they made an investment. Yeah. They did see a return. Yeah. But then they think, oh, well, we have this consumer. They're, they're paying attention to us. But the truth is you still have to put money into it. I mean, New York City is a great example. I love them. And uh, their, their, their tourism department head, headed up. By an openly gay man, Fred Dixon. It's wonderful in New York City. In New York City, and they're very. He's very active this year. Um, he's been active for the last, like, say, at least twelve months, being very out there to going to a lot of LGBT events and really speaking about World Pride and IGLTA and everything coming here. But in general, in other years past, they're not. They don't have to be as active because because it's New York. The gays are <laughs> right. Coming. I mean, well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like San City, Francisco. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, San Francisco. It's like someone says, "Oh, we're going to spend fifty thousand to get the LGBT community to come," <laughs> well, and everybody at the table would be like, "Well, they're already, you know." Yeah. But I'm glad they're doing it though, because that, you, as John and I have seen over the years, um, particularly example of Subaru brand we worked with, still to this day getting residual based upon a lot of the work they did, but have not really been in the market as aggressively as they have um, in years past. And so you say to yourself, it's still important to acknowledge that you're you're there and you're visible. So I'm glad to hear that New York is, is yeah. doing something because you're right. You could just say, you know what, it's Stonewall 50 and it's World Pride and they're all getting here and they're going to do all the heavy lifting for us. Yeah. You know, it's probably a topic for another show where we have even more time. But ju there's just something you said that struck me as funny, which is, you know, they haven't been in the market for a while. You know, nowadays in 2019, when a company says, I want to be in the market, what does that even mean anymore? Like back when we all started, there were very clear things. It was print, television. Well, national, local. Well, no, <laughs> national, no, yeah, exactly. There was a couple of silos out oh. of home. <laughs> there, was mar there was experiential marketing, which was yeah. another fancy way of saying festivals, softball or tournaments. Sampling. Yeah. Sampling. Yeah. 
and you know TV came with logo I guess and you had very few invested you know, in that yeah now you know uh, the members of our community receive their news and information from so many different sources yeah. that it's it's really complicated and you know at the end of the day they you know they call it user generated content but the users are doing all the work on a daily basis anyway so the question then becomes which is a, a bigger answer than I think what we would have time for is what are the destinations or what are the brands or what are the companies doing to realize those conversations are there how can I tap into that and actually be a part of that and maybe have my business or destination more visible on a 24-7 365 basis where you don't have to work as hard because it's there and you see pride festivals and everything there's thousands and thousands of wonderful posts what how can you leverage so that? now you identified one of the the probably the biggest impediment to that happening is the client or in your case if I had hired you you would be able to tell me they have to know what those conversations are happening but instead you know it's all reversed it's like we're here's what we want let's just use the yeah. England the Manchester here's our story here's our destinations we're gonna, we are going to start talking about it when in fact maybe if I hire a pink banana and instead I instead of any results oriented things I say Matt, I want you to take a month to tell me what people are saying about my destination, right? Yeah. And then you would figure out how you want to enter the conversation. It might be more effective. But you know how it's it's usually one way street. Agency or client says, "Here's what we're talking about this." Here's year. what you're supposed to say about <laughs> Manchester. Yeah. Am especially, I right? Especially with Manchester, I just know with I love gay Manchester. Yep. Whenever I go take a peek at it, um, there's this whole campaign they're doing with. And I couldn't. I should be able to tell you more about it. We were. I didn't know we were talking about Manchester. No, I, I pulled that out of a hat. It's a B. There's a B, and this B is this like it's an artist, a local artist made this B, and they have all these different versions, including an, uh, 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 an LGBT one. It's all rainbowed out in just the right way, and these bees are kind of art sculptures are all throughout the city. They've done that with the the cows, and they've done that in different yeah, cities. Yeah. They do, yeah. So Thanks. immediately, you know, if somebody says, if Manchester said, "Hey, we want to tap into some of that," it's like, well, let's start looking at what those what are the what are the bees up to? But between that and pride and all those things, there's so much. Just I, I say pride a lot because that's where you get the most on a on a regular basis. It's just so much out there. And so it's not up to the brand or the destination. They're not in control of this. This is happening. The question is. Yeah, but they is, think they are. They used to. Yeah. They some some still think they are. They used to. <laughs> they used to expect they were. It's it's a it's it's quite a learning curve to go from a PR department and communications yep. and yep. say this is what we're going to say to this is what's going on already and we just want to be a part of it. I think there's still a fear out there too with talking directly to the LGBT market as people will pretend maybe not, but. Yeah. We always hear this misnomer that there's all this money out there for LGBT. Like to market. throw that out first, right? How many? How often have we heard that over the last mm -hmm. 10, 20 years? There is no huge boatload of money waiting to be spent. Do you think? Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> we're you, know, uh, you need to be smart about it and have have the business case for it, and then they may spend it. But I can't tell you right now five brands that are directly marketing to the LGBT consumer. I don't know. I'd, I'd be hard pressed to tell you five. And over the years, Lexus has been. When you said uh, automotive, I was thinking right. of uh, Lexus has been out there, and uh, as well as Hyundai. But uh, Lexus has been consistent, but they've been focusing much more on What's Hyundai storytelling. Doing? I don't know. They were doing some things with their Genesis car. Uh, really? Yeah, with. Uh, but, but in general, um, you don't see as much in that space, I think, as, as I would have expected by now. Well, even a lot of the the liquor brands that were so prevalent, vodka brands seem to have, have gone away, or the airlines. Or... Yeah, yeah. No, what most... are you smirking for, Nash? <laughs> I remember the day. Well, Back in the day. I, like, okay, so, you know, I'm a big fan of Absolute because yeah. they have been a stalwart companion and, uh, and supporter of the LGBTQ community. But their brand, they have, they don't, they can't control one thing about the category. As more premium vodkas appear, their story, if it doesn't change, means they move, they get bumped down the line to eventually being called the Well. You know, that, that's mm -hmm. that's the the house brand when they used to be the premium right, the premium brand choice. So that has little to do with the LGBTQ consumer. But if you're that brand and you say to yourself, okay, we have this built-in base of people who love us because we were always there, and they're probably in their 40s and 50s, what about the younger sets going for, they're going for Tito's or Kettle One or whatever. And, and you to control that or have that conversation is a totally different thing now than it was 20 years ago. I was just going to say I was at a, a bar over the weekend, and I was listening because I was sitting there to what people were ordering. Uh, and it used to always be absolute and tonic, absolute, yeah, absolute and cranberry. cranberry absolute. Yeah. It was all Tito's. 
Tito's and Tonic, yeah. And, and I it was hear a, it all. And it, yeah. and it was a, a gay-friendly bar. It yeah, wasn't all gay, yeah. but there was an awful lot of gay patrons there. And I thought, boy, yeah, yeah. How, how Absolute kind of lost that. It's through no fault of their own. Yeah. Through the consumer simply saying, oh, I want to try this now. And that becomes the, 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 it, the it brand. It's, it's contact Absolute. I know. It's a... It's just a <laughs> It's almost like waves in a big, you know, big Hawaiian coastline. You know, and, you, and you're like the the job, the goal is how do you maintain, how do you stay on one of those waves? How do you yep. surf a wave and keep keep it going, keep going? And the reality is, for most, they just sort of eventually you kind of peter out. What a great example! <laughs> what a good, what a good, the shore. what a good metaphor. You you can never stay in the tube. You know, they call oh, it when the surfers yeah. can go through that curl, but that can't last forever. But you want it to last as long as possible. Possible. <laughs> you can. And so that's the question: What can you do to keep? Because there's always another one that's coming along. What can you do to stay? Until you're ready to retire, that's that's the goal. <laughs> if you find that out, let us yeah, know. Yeah. That's the golden secret, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, the show can't last forever either. So how um, how would people contact you if they're interested? Now, yeah. would you work with smaller companies? Obviously, oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, we're real big on trying to show very clearly, like if a company has five hundred dollars per month to spend, which is usually like an entry level, what can they expect? Whether it's email, banner ads, and that's helped a lot because so a lot great. of companies don't really know what to expect from that. So I think people think oh, it's probably on a. Could, on, well, we think people it's unattainable, but. But uh, yeah. that's great to hear. So the it's logo has pinkbananamedia.com. Pinkbananamedia.com. Right. Or you're also on, on Facebook or you're on Twitter. Yeah. And Matt uh, Scal, M A T T. We also posted it on our Facebook yeah. page today, so you could always contact Matt through there as well. So thanks for joining us. For Thank me. you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you before, uh, before the big event in April. Ah, we and, should plan on it. Yeah. So we'll see what's happening. Hey, thanks everybody for, for joining us today. Thank you, John. Thank you, Matt. Thanks to the boys in the booth. Garrett and John. Thanks to our friends at Deep Discount. Be sure to go to focusgroupradio.com and click on the Deep Discount logo and uh, start shopping away for the shark wide sale. Do, do I have to site-wide say site wide madness? Uh, site wide. What did I call it? Shark wide. Shark, shark wide, site wide. Uh, remember to don't text and drive, arrive alive. Did I get it right today? You got it right, even though you invented it. <laughs> you know, I saw another one today on Jersey Transit that I liked that I messed up once before, but it's phones down, heads up. Oh, I like that one too. Yeah. I like that one. Hey, everybody, have a good week. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.